to start out and relax by starting with a greeting from uh, Gabon. I say Bukai, you say yo, I say, you say yay, and I say Wanye, you say yo. Bukai! Wanye! Base, base. Um, I'm here to talk to the users. Uh, and I noticed, I know our attention span is short, and I'm always last, and I was watching you all leave. I'm glad for those who are users here at State. Um, and the brother from Ireland, and you know, I, I totally understand what you're saying. There, there, are, there are so many good treatments out there. It's really the medical professionals that fuck them up, okay? And that the way that they treat us, not only in methadone clinics and folks who, who prescribe subloxone, but so-called harm reductionists. It's always, uh, you know, we're coming in there and they're going to help us. They've helped us to death, basically. And look, this is an unproven treatment in their paradigm. You said that, uh, the brother from Ireland said that a drug user will try anything, except if there's a bad bag of dope. They ain't going back, okay? The fact that I've done 250 treatments in New York and no one has tried to kill me, I think stands for itself. Those of you who've been opiate dependent, I think that's a significant, a significant statement. Um, we have done 250 treatments. We, I work, uh, usually meet people in a park, park bench by Gandhi at 14th Street at Union Square. I'm there most days. Um, I do a similar screening, but you know, with the help of medical professionals, I take, we take a, uh, uh, an EKG, we take it to a medical, uh, some medical professional, we, I've learned sort of on the fly how to do a, a mental health evaluation, and the first thing I really do is try to talk somebody out of it, because a lot of you are wondering, what is it like? It ain't fucking easy. This is serious, serious medicine. It's been used for 20,000 years, I mean, we, I guess, Okay, I'll say it, we need clinical studies. But it's been pygmy proven, okay? 20,000 years of pygmy use, okay? I know that's not impressive to some of you, but if you met a pygmy, it's very impressive, okay? And I've met pygmies. Um, the, it's not easy, it's very difficult, okay? Um, I, I'll speak briefly about myself. I had a 20-year physical dependency on opiates. Uh, towards the end of it, it was 100 milligrams of methadone, $150 worth of dope, and a bunch of coke for psychosis. Um, and I went through, and I was turning 40, about, this is six years ago this month, and I went through a hell of an experience. I was given a test dose, which is what we do, a small amount to see if I was allergic. The amazing thing about it, and some folks, some entheogen enthusiasts say that, you know, well, they're just tripping and at the end, you know, every, you know they just trip through it. If you give, a, if you give a drug, a, an opiate dependent person some acid, <laughs> And then, like, talk to them in 24 or 8 hours, they're going to be really mad at you, okay? <laughs> what we do is we give a small dose, everyone does. And the significant thing is before the entheogenic effect, the trip starts, people report that they're not dope sick anymore. It happened last week with a guy named Al that we did in a hotel room in, in, in New Jersey. And I know that also adds credibility to my, our side of the story, a guy named Al in a hotel room in New Jersey. <laughs> but Al's not mad at me. I talked to him last night. Al's not mad at me. He took it, he went into a deep, deep, uh, he took, took the first bit, and then we give a slow flood dose, okay? And that, that tripping that you hear is it lasts 36 hours. It depends on the individual. Usually, the tripping time's about eight hours or so, you know? And you come out of it, and if you're opiate dependent, you might need a little bit more, you know? And that might go on for 24 hours. And then you're gonna be tired. What Dr. Wodak said about, you know, Afterwards, that's really important. What we do with af afterwards, and this this is what I'm talking about the users out here. As, as look, harm reduction is about us. We started this shit, okay? They came along later, and you know, evidence based. There wasn't any fucking evidence. It just made sense, right? Now there's evidence based. So this is part of the movement. Ibogaine has been part of this movement since the inception of Ibogaine, and really since the inception of harm reduction and users groups. I mean, if Nico Adrian was doing was doing sessions. You know what I'm saying? I think we're, I think we're in, in the community here. And what I'm saying to those folks around the world who've been coming up to me, look, my biggest problem right now is keeping enough Ibogaine and having enough time because I keep on getting users coming up to me and, and wanting to use. So I wanted to use this and sometimes wanting to use, which is cool. What I'm saying to like the brother from, from, from Ireland or anywhere else and, and for the Balkans and all these folks I've been talking to is there's a way to do this. The way to do it is, my way of doing it, the way that I've learned to do it, is on a sliding scale, because we don't have any government funding. You get like, sort of rich people who want to trip, you know, like some yoga enthusiasts or something, which is really illegitimate. You know, it took me a while to get used to that, but that's cool, because they got money, and if you treat them well, they can help you pay for the other folks. And middle class working folks can help pay for the poor folks. In all the treatments we've done, no one's been turned away for lack of, of funding. It might take a while to get to them, but no one's been turned down. And like I said, the first thing I do is try to talk somebody out of it, because it's no joke. And what we do with someone afterwards is really crucial. 
having no funding and living in America where there's not a lot of options, that becomes problematic. At first, I sort of felt that um, treating someone who was homeless was unfair. And there was a guy named Charlie Bananas. Some of you might know Charlie Bananas, and he wouldn't mind me saying his name right now. He's Lori's side character. And I just, you know, he had some mental health issues, and he was homeless, and I kept saying, Charlie, it's not going to work, you know, I mean, you got to go back into the shelter. And one day he called me up, and every professional, including the, the needle exchange, had said no to him. He had been tossed out of the exchange, he had been told that he had used up his, his, his rehab, uh, you know, allotment, uh, the methadone program tossed him out, and myself and Dana Beal, uh, we did, we got it together for him. And he, and I, he, he's saying, you told me that day, we're walking down the street, he was yelling at cars on the street, and he was, and he was like, every, which is really a great mental health uh, screening now that I'm thinking about it. <laughs> but he would say, everyone is telling me no. Every, and I just said, you know what, yes. And Charlie did, did it, okay? And we did it in the problems, we had, he had to couch surf, and it was a real rough couple of weeks. He called me up and told me that he had hit a lick, you know, that he had robbed somebody of a uh, hundred, uh, hundred Oxycontins, a bunch of Viagra, and a mountain bike. And I said, well, that's like a hell of a weekend. But Charlie, Charlie eventually finished his probation like 10 days later, and it was chaotic as hell. And he's doing all right now. And the other person I want to just talk about really briefly, because there's something else. Just be, we're not talking about just the physical dependence on opiates. We're talking about, a, this, this session's called the user's choice, okay? And unless we're all users here. The only non-user had just left, you know, a doctor like, telling us what he thinks and splitting is kind of like typical. But what, I, what I'm saying is that this is about, is about us taking this choice for ourselves. I do it as safely as I can. I, I do it, we do it with, with, with informed drug users in a loving environment. And I'll just tell you the story about, uh, about Marcus. Marcus was a homeless drug user who has been a client at Lower East Side and several other, and, and, and PHP and several other needle exchanges. And Marcus was, um, physically dependent on, on, on a bunch of opiates, uh, doing, um, you know, the things that we do to make money, you know, uh, and some of them, you know, he wasn't feeling good about, and we, and we did it in, a, in a, somebody's apartment, an old Black Panther who gave us his apartment, this old guy, beautiful guy, Carl Nichols, who recently passed away and was helping us a lot, and, you know, the guy had no place to go later, you know, and he disappeared, he did his IV in session and disappeared, and we lost track of him, and I went around looking for him, because I knew where he, like, uh, did shoplifting, and he would always run through uh, a certain park, and I, w I went looking for him, and, you know, praise Bhuti, I found him one day, it was two weeks later, he was wearing the same raggedy t-shirt, his hair was greasy, he had a bunch of CDs that he just ripped off, and I looked at him, and I said, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry, and he looked at me, and he smiled, and said, thank you so much, Thank you so much. And when I asked him why, he said, because I, that was, this was my decision, and somehow I feel better. He was still using the same amount, still using chaotically, and still using probably unsafely. But something had changed. And this is the type of thing that we can't talk about, or we're not supposed to talk about. But damn it, this is part of it. The part of it is the effect of Ibogaine as an entheogen, uh, as an entheogen, as a healing agent. And I, I don't know how you measure that, but I see it every day. I see it every day. I see individuals change for the better. We meet them where they are. We let them make the choice. And somebody else that I'm thinking about right now, this brother, you know, has come from like a harm reduction background. And I, and, you know, he, he used again. And I kind of felt bad about that. Because one of the problems that we're having is we're not really preparing folks to use again. Okay? And I think that's one, one part we're really falling short. And I'm going to cut it brief. And I, and I was thinking about presentations. And all of a sudden I called him up and I, I, he was using again and he was going through some depression. And I asked him, um, excuse me. I asked him how he, how he felt about his experience, and he said that he, for the first time he felt valued and felt that he deserved, and this is going to sound corny, he deserved to be hugged. He deserved to be held. And you know what? If he used it again, that's fine. Because there's another tradition, and let me go back to Bwiti just really quickly. This has been used for 20,000 years by Bwiti and Bantu in Gabon. We must pay respect to them. They've used it, and we also must use their technology. And I'll just end with this. You can do this by yourself. You can do this, and we'll teach you how to do it. We'll come if we can get the money and the funding. If not, we'll talk on the internet, and we'll tell you how to do it as safely as possible, and we'll tell you the risks. I'm talking to the drug users out there. You can do this. It's growing every day. And the other thing is to not only look to us, but to look to Bwiti, to look to Africa, because it's technology. And the more and more that I do this, now we're in New Jersey, and we're painting our faces, and we're playing African music, and we're dancing, and I don't know how we measure that, or whether it's got you know, the evidence behind that, but it seems pretty good, and that's all I got. Thank you.